Ms. McMillan, Dean Leonard, faculty, fellow alumni, future alumni, many of whom are here, family and friends. Thank you for joining us today for the third annual Dorothy Day Lecture. It is so hard to believe that six years ago when we began this journey, that by 2016, we'd be joining together for our third lecture. Our decision to develop this lecture series emerged from a desire to honor the women who had shaped the college journey with us. We came to the realization that the late 60s and early 70s had imbued, had imbued us all with a lifelong commitment to economic and social justice. That commitment did not end with graduation, and the lives of alumni bear witness to that in many simple and powerful ways. It is, and always has been, integral to what makes us Emmas and Saints. <laughs> A whole new category for some of us. <laughs> but we're trying. The series is named for Dorothy Day, a courageous and feisty woman of faith who dedicated her life to the struggle for economic and social justice. Don't you think she could have been an Emma? I do. <laughs> but I don't think I could have won the bandana that she did. So over the past three years, we have looked at social justice, first through the lens of an alumni panel, reflecting on the impact of the 60s and 70s on their lives. And then we moved to the power of example of two very different women. In 2014, Sister Simone Campbell, with great humor and wisdom, reflected on the joy of the gospel. She modeled relentlessness and resiliency in her quest for justice. Last year, Reverend Liz Walker eloquently reflected on the power of grace in the smallest of moments and how all of these moments can make a difference in the world. These lectures and the panel would not have been possible without many, many people sharing their time and their talent. From the beginning, our partner has been the Alumni Development Office. And we have been blessed to work with many dedicated people from that office. Today, we would like to publicly acknowledge the tireless efforts of Edie Turner, who has begun a well-deserved retirement. Edie's attention to detail and dedication was, is, and will always be deeply appreciated. Thank you so much, Edie. She's enjoying Florida. <laughs> <laughs> we should give her a round of applause. Our contemporary guardian angel is Molly Zuccarini. Molly, your grace, sensitivity, creativity, and incredible work ethic has been so deeply appreciated. Thank you, Molly, and thank all the good men and women of the Alumni Development Office. We would also like to acknowledge all the alumni who have served on the Speaker Selection Committee, on the Steering Committee, and have assisted with developing our fundraising efforts. The class of 1971 generously endowed this series, but going forward, we will, need, we will continue to need your financial support. A major change in this past year has been the addition of a faculty member to the Speaker Selection Committee. Professor Adam Silver. You gotta stand up. <laughs> he didn't know this was gonna happen. His contributions have been significant, and we've also had a lot of fun working with him and enjoyed a lot of the scotting together. <laughs> Adam also assisted in identifying a student who has served on the Speaker Selection Committee, Emily Larkin. Now you've got to see it, Emily. <laughs> Hope will stay engaged with us after graduation. Emily just told me that she has won a Fulbright. <laughs> and then moving on to graduate school in DC, but we're not letting go of you. So thank you for your service. 
When we met with Adam and Emily last year, they were the ones who recommended the topic of food justice for the lecture series, as it is a compelling issue for current students. They also recommended the speaker we will hear today. We felt that a speaker on food justice would also give us an opportunity to highlight the compelling work being done on the Notre Dame campus. You've been watching the looping of the, DV, of the video about the alternate spring break and the work students are doing with food justice, and it will be continued to be shown over in the auditorium later on. You've seen the video looping, and it is just amazing. The first time I saw it, I'll use an old Irish expression, because I'm an old Irish woman now, I guess, <laughs> that it won the cockles of my heart. <laughs> It was so touching to see the joy that the students took in what they were doing and to see this true commitment to justice. Part of what Father talked about in Mass today was a commitment to justice and service to each other. So obviously we somehow had to combine food justice with what's going on at the Notre Dame campus. If you have not been for a visit there, you have to go there. It is an incredible part of Emmanuel now. And during the refreshment time after the lecture, there will be students available to speak to you about what's going on at the Notre Dame campus. It's quite amazing. And again, you'll feel very proud. I mean, it made me feel very proud, and anybody else that I sent the video to, they had the same reaction like, oh, it just made me so proud to be an Emmanuel grad. And today's lecture is really about an effort to join the Dorothy Day Lecture Series commitment to social justice to what is happening today in the here and now at Emmanuel. Because we are one community. And it is justice that binds us. Deidre Bradley Turner, who is the Director of Community Service and Service Learning. You're going to stand up too, Deidre. <laughs> has described this commitment to social justice as the golden thread that weaves through the history of Emmanuel, which is a great metaphor. So today, we are delighted to introduce Tracy McMillan as our speaker. Tracy, our third lecturer, I love the sound of that. <laughs> Tracy is the author of The American Way of Eating, Undercover at Walmart, Applebee's, Farm Fields, and The Dinner Table. Her books are for sale, I think, before the lecture, and then after the lecture, they'll be available outside the auditorium, and Tracy will be signing copies. It was a 2012 bestseller. The New York Times called her a voice the food world needs. And what they went on to say was her central concern in her journalism, and in this provocative book, is food and class. She, stuck, she stares at the American, she looks at the American's bounty, noting that so few seem able to share in it fully, and asks, what would it take for all of us to eat well? Blending investigative journalism and undercover reporting with intimate and touching storytelling, Tracy's work has been acclaimed by institutions ranging from the James Beard Foundation to the James Aronson Award for Social Justice Journalism. A 2013 Knight Wallace Fellow at the University of Michigan, McMillan is now a staff blogger at the National Geographic and has written for publications including the New York Times, Hoppers, and Food and Wine. In 2014, she was the Koppel Journalism Fellow at Wesleyan University and currently serves as a senior fellow at the Schuster Institute for investigative journalism at Brandeis University. Since the start of her career in the late 1990s, Tracy has written about American inequality and food, using a discussion of our meals to plumb the depths of social and economic class in the United States. Today, she is a sought after lecturer, speaking across the country about her work, especially the growing class divide as it relates to food. I give you Tracy McMillan. 
So, of course, thank you very much to all of my gracious and generous hosts here at Emmanuel. Um, I came to campus yesterday and have just been having such a wonderful time. You guys really know how to do hospitality well. I, I don't think it hurts that um, the women that I've met have been incredibly charming and interesting themselves also. Um, and particularly, you know, of course, I need to thank Sister Janet for bringing me, even though she wasn't able to be here right now. Um, and all the folks from the class of 71. Um, it's interesting, I don't think I've ever been at a dinner party before where everyone's name was some derivative of Mary or Margaret. <laughs> and then I have, and I've certainly also enjoyed very much um, the patience of Molly Zuccarini because I, I try to be pleasant, but I'm really scattered and she's been incredibly patient with me. Um, you know, when I first talked with Rosemary last summer and I told her then, and what I'll tell you guys all now, is that I'm very touched by this invitation. You know, I get a number of them to speak around the country, and I don't accept all of them, but it's really hard to turn down one uh, where I'm being charged with carrying on a legacy of someone as interesting and inspiring as Story of the Day. Um, and Rosemary didn't know this when she invited me to speak, and I actually discussed this with her a little bit over dinner last night, but I spent my college years as a campus political activist in New York, and I was particularly interested and inspired in the work of Michael Harrington, who's an American Democratic Socialist, and so his introduction to radical politics came through the Catholic worker movement that Dorothy helped to found and, and to run. And so for me, it's a particularly interesting lineage to sort of see myself as a part of, um, which is, I mean, I am humbled to think I'm a part of that lineage, I should say, and also to see how that ties into our contemporary political politics, right? Our contemporary, that's not very good English, um, our contemporary politics, right, with having an, an actual democratic socialist running for president and people paying some attention to it. Um, so it's a really nice reminder for me to think about Dorothy Day and what exactly links the work of a sort of tra a traditional socialist like Dorothy um, to today. And what's the idea between uh, the idea of linking a just society and the idea of taking our food seriously. Um, and so the reason, right, this is what I, I sort of go around talking about is I wrote this book that came out four years ago. and. When you sort of start to think, so, you know, my background, right, was as a young person, sort of democratic socialist campus activist, and then was covering poverty and welfare mostly in New York City in the late 90s, early 2000s. So how do I end up writing about food? And that really comes down to one word, which is foodie. So this is a fairly new word, and so the very formal definition, and this is pretty close, I think, to what you find in dictionaries, because it is in dictionaries now, is a person who enjoys and cares about food very much. And it started being used about 10 years ago, which is when, in sort of contemporary memory, the U.S. started taking a very serious look at its food and talking about where it came from, was it sustainable, was it local, organic, all that stuff was fairly new to mainstream culture until about 10, 15 years ago. And the thing about foodies is they aren't necessarily interested in local food or food politics. They're just really in to food. So they look at food the way some people look at fashion. So they follow it to be hip, to know what trends are, what's hot and popular, and they take a lot of pictures of their food. So, you know, they obsess over ingredients and they follow chefs, sort of like people talk about rock stars, and that's actually a literal thing, right? So the food, the foodie definition though, isn't really complete like that first one because it ignores the context of foodies. Um, and the better definition, I think, one that gets sort of more at how we really think about this comes from Urban Dictionary. And I'm gonna apologize. I'm at a college, so I tend to be fairly irreverent with my college talks, and so I hope this isn't too transgressive for you all. Um, <laughs> so, I should say, right, I haven't met very many people that are actually this kind of foodie. Like, some people often will sort of hint at this. Um, and so this idea of foodie, like a lot of things, is half media creation and half reality, but it sticks in your head and it really stuck in mine. And it particularly stuck in mine about 10 years ago in 2006 when I read a mega bestseller by Michael Pollan called The Omnivore's Dilemma. And I should say, Michael is a really lovely person and writer and a phenomenal thinker. This book that he wrote, The Omnivore's Dilemma, is a really profound text and it's important to read it. But he and I don't agree on everything, which has a lot to do with our backgrounds, I think. And in some ways, even though we're both writing books about food and food systems, we write to very different audiences. And this is clearest in a sentence in The Omnivore's Dilemma uh, introduction that really stuck with me ever since I read it. And if I'm honest, this sentence is really a, sort of a very iconic thing about why I came to write The American Way of Eating and what made me really start to take food seriously. 
right? And so the quote, right, is many people today seem perfectly content eating at the end of an industrial food chain without a thought in the world. This book, The Omnivore's Dilemma, is probably not for them. There are things in it that would ruin their appetite. And so the problem I have with this isn't necessarily the idea that some people care about food and some people don't, but more like the reality and the context that's suggested behind you know, this couple of sentences, or that, that's one long sentence actually, <laughs> right? Because this sentence only makes sense if you think every family out there that's eating processed food is doing it because they don't care about their health or their families. And there are some pretty strong class implications there. You know, low-income people generally have a harder time affording the kind of diets we now understand to be healthy. And partly I found it offensive because of that. It's sort of a messed up argument to have about the world and how it eats um, on the to sort of build this idea that all people have the same resources and if they decide to eat poorly, it's because they don't care. But I was also offended for a much more personal reason because I was pretty sure that Michael Pollan was talking about me and my family and the kinds of people I grew up with. And so, the question sort of comes to be sort of like, so what does that look like, right? So I'm going to back up a little bit further and tell you a little bit about my background so you can understand why exactly I care about this so much. So as a way of introduction, this is really what I grew up eating. And I, I think this is probably exactly what Michael Pond was talking about when he was mentioning eating at the end of an industrial food chain. You know, my family was a white working class. My dad sold lawnmowers. My mom was sick for most of my childhood. And she died when I was in high school. So mostly what we ate was whatever was cheap and easy for a single dad. And my dad also being true to sort of the background he came from, he was so dead set against being a snob. He was sort of a snob about not being a snob. <laughs> Right, and one of the snobbiest in the in the initial sense, right? One of the snobbiest things you could do in my house was eat fancy food. So fancy food was for fancy people, for people who thought food was special and to be daydreamed about and who thought their meals would tell the world who they were. And my dad was basically like, screw that, let's just have dinner. Like stop making a big deal out of nothing. And so for a long time, if you tried to get me to eat anything besides like pizza, Captain Crunch, ice cream, Snickers, bagels, coffee, popcorn, all that, I was pretty likely to just sort of say, yeah, well screw that. And then I went to work uh, for an affluent family in New York, the McAuliffe Rush Kriegels, who were very lovely. Um, they hired me to tutor their kids and sort of be a bit of a nanny, and they were incredibly kind to me. Um, and they were also wealthy in a way that I didn't quite, I had no idea that reality could be like this. So, I mean, like they were rich, like their 11 year old had already gone to the Galapagos Islands on a private yacht, rich. Um, and I was like, I, I've been on a paddle boat in a state park. <laughs> Right? And I got to eat dinner with them four nights a week. And so I was eating what I had grown up thinking was fancy food. Except it wasn't really that fancy, right? It was just you know a different kind of lettuce with a dressing we made at the house, maybe some toasted nuts, um, strange rices that did not come in a like boil in the bag bag, um, bread that didn't come already sliced, or it was couscous and vegetables, which I became obsessed with. Which, and you know that's not fancy food in Morocco where it's from, but it's considered kind of fancy here, especially in the 90s. Um, or we had veggie burgers. And here's what I discovered, right? I was like, oh. The fancy food is good. I like this stuff. And you know, it, it didn't take very long for me to get to the point of being like, I have been fooled. Those rich people put one over on me. Why did I think this wasn't for me? Right? Why did I think I was supposed to be eating potato chips and a bunch of stuff that will make me fat and sick and that these people, these very nice but very wealthy people, are, they're the ones who are supposed to be eating the healthy, delicious stuff. Who made these rules? Why are they there? Because that fancy food, right? And again, part of my French, like that's the good shit, right? So when Michael Pollan gets up there and starts talking about how people at the end of the industrial food system, whatever he specifically meant by that, if that they don't care about what they're eating, I bristled because I understood him to be talking about me. Because for me, it was never that I didn't care about my health or my family, and it certainly wasn't that my dad didn't care or my grandma didn't care. It was just that the terms of our lives meant that eating anything other than the fastest, cheapest meals was really difficult. And I took offense to someone saying that that problem was actually that my family didn't care. And it was the sort of thing, right, when I would read that Michael Pollan thing, I would have this, this instinct where I would be like, I'm just going to go out and binge eat on Little Debbie's and Cool Whip and tuna casserole and Doritos and it will be awesome and industrial and whatever, Michael Pollan. And, you know, like a lot of things done out of spite, that wouldn't have really helped me very much. Um, mostly I would have gotten indigestion. And to be fair, right, I don't, Michael Pollan doesn't care what I individually am eating in my home. <laughs> 
Um, so I needed to figure out another way to challenge the idea that my family deserved what they got if they chose to eat a crappy diet, which is to say if they ate the diet our countries made the easiest thing to eat. Because the food in our stores and on our dinner tables and in vending machines and restaurants, it's not inevitable, right? This isn't the way that the world has to be. It's the product of a million tiny decisions by humans, government and business, cooks and farmers, moms and dads. And that means it can be changed by us too. And so I really wanted to know, and, and Rosemary hinted at this, like what would it take for all of us to eat well? And that's what led me to my book. So to write The American Way of Eating, I went and I did a few things. Um, I went and I worked undercover in three jobs in the food system. So I worked as a farm worker in industrial California fields. Um, I worked in the produce and grocery sections of two Walmart super centers, which is the kind of Walmart that sells groceries in Michigan, and in the kitchen of a New York City Applebee's. And the deal was that I had to live and eat off my wages in each job for two months, and then I could take that storyline, that narrative, right, is how we talk about it in sort of journalist circles, as a way to have a discussion about food and class in America. Or if we're going to be like a lot less pretentious about it, right, like if I live as a broke American worker and take notes on what I eat and then do research about what was the food I was eating, like that sort of what I was going to do. And I don't just ask, like, why did I think that's the food that would taste good, right? I talk about also, like, what food could I afford and what time did I have to prepare it? What did I need to know in order to make it? How hard was it for me to find it or find time to buy it? Like, what kinds of farming made that food possible? All those kinds of questions. Um, and I, I always like to sort of explain, especially when I'm doing talks, because this is the sort of thing, like, this is the, the bonus thing on the DVD where, like, you won't get this in the book, right? <laughs> so I really didn't like this idea for the book at first. It felt sort of opportunistic to me to go and live in poor people's jobs and tell that story as if I'd gone and become one of them. Even though, I mean, to be fair, right, my background is like I've been fairly close to that life uh, for most of mine. But I decided to go ahead and do it anyway for a couple of reasons. And so first, it does make the book more interesting. Um, I don't defend this as something I admire about our society, but it's true that it's more interesting for a trained journalist with a college education and a lot of options to go in and write about that than it is to say, have a farm worker tell you um, what's difficult about their life. That's just part of how media works in this country. Um, Second, I do think it depends on how you tell the story. Um, so even if the structure for the book is a little problematic, I think that you can be thoughtful and compassionate and honest about your work, then you can mitigate a lot of those problems. And third, and this was most important actually in the end, I really wanted to do not just like what is my experience, but I want in terms of you know what's the job like and my time like during the day, I wanted to really understand how a change in life circumstances changed the way I thought and felt about my food and my meals. So I don't make much money as a writer, um, but I do have a lot of freedom with my time. I know a lot about food and cooking. Um, and so how did my diet change or my income and the shape of my life changed? You know, and that's something that would be very difficult to know about another person, right? It's almost, you'd have to be like someone's food therapist, essentially, right? Like really going like deep into like their psyche because you're deconstructing the thought process. But if I pay attention to myself, it's much easier and quicker to do that. Um, and so I decided I would go and I would do this book. Um, so I'm going to share a few reporting stories from the book. Uh, as I said, right, I spent about two months in each job. And then the idea was I'd see what life was like for the people who feed us. Not that I was going to have an authentic experience, not magically going to become an undocumented migrant worker um, and know what that's like. But I was going to get a lot closer look than most people. So farming. I did some time in grapes and in peaches in the Central Valley, um, but as you may or may not know, anyone who is not from California, I think it's a little hard to sort of understand this until you see it. So the Central Valley is actually a desert. Um, and after a week of 105 degree temperatures, I actually got heat sick. And what that means, I'm sorry for the squeamish folks here, um, I projectile vomited for an afternoon. And advocates they had spoken to before they went out there explained to me people die pretty much every year in the fields because it's so hot and the pressure to work is so hard and there's often not enough shade or water to protect workers. And so I knew this was a problem. And once I had an afternoon of puking, I took that as a sign that um, I was on the short list for possibly being one of those people that dies. So I decided um, I would move. Um, which is something you know most migrant workers have far less options to do, but I still had some of my sort of startup funds for that part of the reporting. So I moved on to the Salinas Valley in California. Um, so the Salinas Valley is known as the salad bowl of America. California is responsible for about a third of all the produce eaten in the U.S., and you'll find California lettuces in almost every grocery store. Um, but I didn't get a job picking lettuce. That's actually incredibly hard physical labor because lettuce, as most of you probably know, right, has a lot of water in it. So a case of lettuce is like 50 pounds 
pounds and you have to like lift and throw it up to somebody and um, you may notice I'm small. Um, so that would be a little difficult. But my landlady in the Salinas Valley, she had a cousin who was working in garlic and he agreed to take me to work with him. So we get there at 5.30 in the morning before the sun's up and in the light from a truck's headlights, I get handed a bucket and pruning shears and I'm told to start cutting. And I do what the other workers are doing. I kneel in the dirt and I grab a handful of garlic stalks and start cutting off the roots and then I cut off the stalks and drop the heads into a bucket. And once it gets light out and people can tell I'm not Mexican, the supervisors come over and start asking me about who I am and why I'm working in the fields. And I just tell them first in very bad Spanish and then in short English that I, I have a lot of problems and I don't want to talk about it. And as long as I can make minimum wage, I'd much rather not have to talk to customers and hang out in the fields. And here's something I learned because I, you know, I'm a journalist, so by nature I'm pretty nosy. I'm not really scared most of the time to ask questions. But most people apparently are. People do not ask you a lot of questions. So after a few days of me showing up and working a full day, I mean, I think everyone just kind of gave up and they're like, well, that just must be a really broke white lady. And everyone else, so far as I could tell, who was cutting garlic with me was undocumented. Almost everybody was Triqui, uh, which is an indigenous group from southern Mexico. Um, I think when I was growing up, right, I just thought of all Mexicans as just sort of being alike and all from, they're just all from Mexico, which is, some giant mass that where everyone's the same. Um, but like uh, most societies, there are a lot of divides in Mexican uh, society between mestizos, which are the mixed race folks um, that are descendants of the Spanish conquistadors, and the indigenous folks. So the Triqui have their own language, which means Spanish is their second. Um, I actually can't, I still can't understand or, or say, speak any of it. It's a very tonal, so almost like an Asian language. So to me, it just, I can't comprehend any of it. And these are the people that I work alongside. Mostly people are very kind to me and after a while I realized that part of this is, I mean, they're all very nice people, but part of it's because I'm female and I'm white. Like there's an understanding that if there's a white woman out in the fields, something very bad has happened to her. And also everyone, I realize, thinks that I'm very, very young. So I was 32 when I was doing this reporting. People often ask me if I was 15 or 16 years old. So at first I was like, I am doing well, this is great. Um, and then after a while right, I think about it, I'm like, well, I might be doing all right. It's also possible that um, a 32-year-old indigenous woman right, has probably crossed the desert on foot at least once. She's born five to six, seven, eight children, and she's been working outside since she was 14 or 15. So it's not that I'm looking so great, it's just that a 13-year-old indigenous woman right, is going to look way older um, than someone who's been doing office work. So in this community, right, I kind of look like a child. And everyone knows I'm a citizen, though, and that also gives me a special standing in how people treat me in nearly every way. Um, but there's one place where I get treated like everybody else, and that's in my paycheck. So every day when I get to the field, I'm handed a tarjeta, a card that folds in half, and I had lost the photo I have of this, um, but it looks like this roughly. It has the same grid of numbers on either side, the same list of hours of the day, and when I come in, a woman punches the hour that I came in at. Usually it's 5.30 or 6 o'clock, and then whenever I bring up buckets of garlic, she punches one number for each, four, five, six, seven, and so on. So we're paid $1.60 for each five-gallon bucket of garlic, Every bucket weighs about 25 pounds, I'm told. So that means I'm paid about six cents per pound of garlic. Um, and that translates, I realized later, to about 2% of the price of what somebody pays at the store. So when I leave every day, the card is punched with the hour I came in and the hour that I left and how many buckets of garlic I picked. And on my first day, I get credit for 10 buckets. I should say I probably picked five or six because men kept coming up and dumping half buckets into mine and sort of donating garlic to me, which stopped after like a couple of weeks, but you know, it's very handy. Um, and I also felt like both honored and guilty, but you know, that's, we can talk about that like over coffee. <laughs> um, so I was there from about 5.30 in the morning till three in the afternoon with a half hour lunch, that's nine hours, but I get 10 buckets. Right, so it's a dollar sixty each. So that's sixteen dollars. And California law, which is stronger for farm workers than in most states, because most farm worker rules are, are sort of very state by state. California law requires me to earn minimum wage, and at that time it was eight dollars an hour. So nine hours, eight dollars. That's seventy-two. And the way this works is it's the job of the farm labor contractor, which is the group that has hired and overseen all the labor, to make sure I'm paid a legal wage. 
and I know they know I'm a citizen, so I figure I'm probably gonna end up earning minimum wage. But when I get my paycheck, something strange has happened. It's a regular paycheck, so it's blue and white with Social Security taken out and everything, and it says I'm being paid $1.60 a bucket, which is the same, and it says I picked 10 buckets, so that's the same, but the hours are not the same. They have been changed from nine to two. So two hours at $8 comes out to $16, which is exactly what I picked, and just happens to be minimum wage. So somewhere between the field of my paycheck, someone said, hey, you know, 16 bucks of garlic, it does an hour, so minimum wage, two, two hours. And they changed that on my check. And so I made less on that day, I made less than $2 an hour. But if anyone looks at the payroll records, it looks like I made minimum wage. And this isn't legal, but it happens to pretty much everybody I work with because, of course, I'm new and weaker and I'm very, I'm, I was a very bad farm worker as far as skills go. But even the best pickers, they're picking three or four dollars, three or four buckets an hour. And to make minimum wage, you have to pick five. And when I call the state's labor department and tell them about this, they basically shrug. They tell me, well, yeah, that happens all the time. And they can't really do anything about it, they say, because there's not really any political power or interest in doing that. And these are undocumented workers who don't have a voice in politics in the state. And it's just one small farm labor contractor on one farm in a state with 86,000 farms. So I do what my coworkers do, and I put up with it and make do with $2 an hour. And you know, I could stop the story there, but I do want to make something very clear. Here I am so poor on my wages that I am literally hungry. Like not in a like, oh, I could really use a snack kind of way, but like always hungry because I can't afford enough food. So every week I start accompanying the women that I work with to a food donation at a house where we, I mean, to me, this was just mind blowing. Like you stand there with a bag held out like a trick or treater or a beggar and women come and just sort of divvy up sort of leftovers from a supermarket and put it in there. And it's not lost on me, right, that these are the people who feed us and they're not getting paid enough to feed themselves. So the next place I go is to Walmart. And I pick this because it's the largest grocer in the US and the world. Um, this single chain is responsible for about a fifth to a quarter of all grocery sales in the US. And by comparison, in the early 20th century, A&P held so much market share that the government required it to split apart a bit over antitrust concerns. At the time, A&P was at 8%, right? So Walmart's at least double or triple that. Um, I end up getting a job in the produce department at Walmart about 20 minutes outside of Detroit. There was a stint during winter um, where I was stocking the baking aisle um, on the night shift at a Walmart. So um, I can tell you that November, December is prime marshmallow month. Um, also flour and sugar, big sellers there. Um, so I end up getting this job in the produce department at this Walmart about 20 minutes outside of Detroit working under a supervisor. Um, I'm gonna call the supervisor Randy and I'm making, like most people make, about minimum wage and I'm only offered part-time work, um, which ends up being about 20 to 25 hours a week. So my supervisor Randy is college age, maybe 20, and he came to produce from the electronics department. And that's really what strikes me because Randy doesn't know anything about food. And it takes me a little while to realize this because I sort of am like, oh, he's the head of produce. He must understand something here. Um, I do notice initially that the produce is rarely cold, uh, which is the process of going through what's on the shelf and pulling out the stuff that started to rot. Um, it isn't really saleable anymore. But what really gets me is the walk-in where all the produce that has to be refrigerated is stored and there's a leak in the cooler when I start and it's dripping into buckets and so it's raising the humidity level so high that a lot of the produce is molding over at a pretty alarming rate so this is right like a cell phone picture I will say this is before everyone had smartphones so I think this was like a surreptitious Blackberry photo um, so there's a day about halfway through my time there where I'm stocking asparagus on the floor and I realize that the bunch in my hand is molded over on the bottom so I go oh, okay I can set this I grab the next bunch and that's moldy too and the next one, and the next one, and I'm like, oh, the whole case is rotted. I'm gonna have to take that back. And I pull out the next case of asparagus, right, in the cooler, and all of that's moldy too. And then, then it dawns on me, like, oh, I should look at the dates, because I just assumed these would be the, like the most, you know, the, the cases would be the next thing I should put out. Um, and I realize all of the boxes in the cooler are um, dated the first week of May, and it's then the first week of June. And what's been happening is nobody's been rotating stock out of the cooler properly. And so in the end, I end up throwing out 10 cases of asparagus, so that's 200 pounds, because the cooler's been handled so poorly. Um, and the interesting thing for me, right, is I've been doing all this business press reading about Walmart, and everything I've ever heard about Walmart is that it is a model of efficiency and economies of scale. And maybe that's true for sneakers and MP3s, and candy and soda, like, 
stuff that doesn't rot, but I see zero evidence of this for produce. So there are pallets and pallets of sweet corn that come in and they get so molded over that we have to strip it entirely of its husks before it can be sold. And that takes us so long to do that we end up donating most of it anyway. And you know, at first I was really tempted, particularly because I was working under him, to blame Randy for this. Um, but when I think about it, right, that's kind of unfair because he's a 20-year-old kid, he's delivering pizza half the time too and working at Walmart full-time the rest or close to full-time. And until a couple of months ago, right, he'd been doing electronics. And if he's bad at his job, it's because he was hired into one he wasn't trained to do well, right? And this makes me really start thinking. And I realize, you know, I find it annoying to work under Randy because I feel like he's not doing a good job. But this is actually a big public health problem, too, because how well Randy does his job has pretty serious health implications for the community that that store is in. There's one other large grocer in town, um, and the way the industry sort of talks about market share and all that, the, basically Walmart's probably responsible for, responsible for about half the food being sold in the town. And that means that half that town is depending on Randy's skill right, for fresh produce. And so that's a really big problem. And so we talk about food access and food deserts and food swamps and all those conversations, you know, we're treating supermarkets as the equivalent of a healthy diet. And we say, if there's a supermarket, you'll have access to healthy food and therefore healthy food will be eaten. But the thing about that actually is that produce is a tiny part of Wal Mart's grocery department. It's run poorly and mo a lot of the food isn't great. And otherwise the place is overrun with snacks and cookies and crackers and soda and the kinds of food that are made from grain that's been heavily subsidized by the government. And in the previous farm bill, and I apologize, I haven't crunched numbers on the most recent one, but um, so these numbers have shifted a little bit, but the basic point is still the same. Like we spend about 42% of our farm subsidies on commodity crops like corn and soy, which go mostly to feed livestock or milk <coughs> sweeteners. Um, and also fuel, right, from ethanol. And we also spend 5% on fruit and vegetable crops, which is what the USDA calls specialty crops. And, you know, we have to sort of keep in mind, right, we're supposed to get about half our calories from fruits and vegetables, so it's really hard for me to look at a supermarket that's full of junk food, right, in a lot of ways, and not think maybe we're spending money on the wrong thing. So when I'm working there at Walmart, I don't shop there a lot. Um, I kind of end up developing this thing where I'm like, I just don't want to spend any more time there than I have to. And um, because I'm new there, I also don't get a, um, an employee discount yet. So there's sort of no financial incentive for me to go there. Um, but on my final day, I'm like, no, you know what? I should buy some of the food here. Like, that's part of the reporting, too. Um, so I buy cantaloupe and some pickled jalapenos and a few other things. And when I take them home and eat them, they're terrible. I mean, I don't, I don't mean they're inedible, but they're just, they're bad. The cantaloupe tastes like watery cardboard. There's no flavor. There's no sweetness. The jalapenos are mushy and disintegrate when I bite into them. And I realized something. Like, if this is what I thought cantaloupe and jalapenos tasted like, I would stick to tuna helper. <laughs> right? Which is really what my family was doing when I was growing up. Now, the last place I went to um, was Applebee's, which I chose that for a couple of reasons. First, because it's the largest fast casual chain in the world. Second, it's a restaurant, this was important to me, that pretty much every American has been to. So if you live outside of a big city like I did growing up, it's the kind of place you might go for like your Friday night family dinner. Um, if you live in a big city, you've probably been to an Applebee's and you've been on a road trip or something like that. But there's also a third reason I like it. And that's because I'm going to work at an Applebee's in New York City at a time when the city's restaurants have really come to be famous across the country. Um, one of the most famous is Les Al, which is where Anthony Bourdain worked. And so like the, the contradictory, um, the contrarian in me, right, really likes the idea of saying like, yeah, oh, you know how fancy New York City kitchen works now, but what about Applebee's, right? So I go to Applebee's with a version of the same story I told people in the field. I have a lot of problems, traveled around a lot, now maybe I want to go to cooking school and I want to check out a professional kitchen before I go spend all that money. And New York City, I find out, has 25 Applebee's at the time. About half of them are hiring. And I go and I apply at all of them. And I finally get hired at one in downtown Brooklyn. Now I've worked in kitchens before. In high school, I stocked a salad bar and waited tables at a big boy. So I know very well that most of the food comes in pre-cooked or pre-mixed. You know, maybe the eggs aren't going to be freshly cracked. You know, dressing might be coming in in cartons. But at Applebee's, that's really taken to a whole other level. Almost the entirety of the back of the restaurant is given over to dry storage. There's a very small walk-in and freezer, smaller than what my small town big boy had. And there are, by my count, five vegetables five that come in whole. So there's iceberg lettuce, tomatoes, and onions, right, which are required for burger dressing, um, baking potatoes, and red potatoes. You can get this up to six if you count the cilantro. And everything else, right, is processed, frozen, preserved. And it's 
really the end of that industrial food chain Michael Pollan was talking about. It's the kind of food that can travel endlessly, never rots, never really goes bad. And usually my job is I expedite the food, so I make sure all the dishes for a table are ready to go. They have all the sauces and the sides and the garnishes, and I gather them up for a server to take out. But I do some work in the prep kitchen too, and that's when I really get to understand more about how the food works. So like the broccoli sides, um, the broccoli comes in giant pillowy bags of florets. I try and figure out where it's from, but there's no label, like not even for what company had, had sold it to us. And to make the broccoli, I mix an envelope of powder with warm water to make a dressing, then you toss the broccoli in it, and then you portion out five ounces at a time into plastic baggies, and you date them. And for mashed potatoes, I put rinsed, I'm directed to rinse, not scrub them, potatoes in the steamer, mash them by hand, and mix it with a bag of garlic milk, which is a block of white frozen liquid that I have to thaw first. No idea what's in it, but it's delicious. Um, and I portion those out at about 10 ounces per bag. And when service begins, the guys on the line have trays of broccoli and mashed potatoes in their coolers, and they nuke each one separately for orders. But during rush, they take a shortcut, shortcut and they nuke whole platter fills of it and then set them under the heat lamp. Um, and this is like a great way to sort of economize your time and, and be really quick, but what happens is the heat degrades the plastic. And so my job as Expo is to sort of, when the order comes in, right, the cooks nuke whatever it is and they put it on a plate, sits there, um, then they add the meat or whatever it is and I take the individual plate off and right before the food goes out onto the floor I have to empty the bags because otherwise stuff will congeal and look, you know not, not look very good. Um, so what happens when I do that usually is that the bags disintegrate over the food and they scatter delicate flakes of plastic all over the food. Um, and there's no way to remove it from it. And you know, because I know things about foodie stuff, I'm like, ah, if, like, if I was a diner out there, right, I would be like, oh, looks like Applebee's upgrading to Fleur de Sel, like has like some <laughs> fancy salt going on. So I just, you know, send it out like that plastic and all. And I know I should care more, right? Part of me does, but it's really hard for me to feel like I should make this argument to my bosses. When I come in for trainings, they tell me not to clock in, they'll fix the paycheck, but they never do. They never pay me for that time. They don't give me copies of my check, which they're legally required to do, but they don't give me copies of my check unless I ask for it. And they don't, and that only really works if I catch the manager at the right time. Uh, and they don't even pay me what they said they would. So I go in and they say, oh, we're gonna pay you $9 an hour. And it turns out I only end up getting paid eight. And I never managed to get this corrected. And what this means is that I eat at Applebee's a lot because I get a free meal with every shift that I work. So I avoid the sides and stick to the grill when I do that. So it's burgers and fish sandwiches. And by the time I'm at Applebee's, I've gotten better at eating while broke. So I don't really run out of food very often. But when I do, right, I'm saved by Applebee's. So the question then becomes, right, after all these stories, and, and we can talk about, you know, anything else you like about sort of what I did or how I did it uh, in the Q&A. The question then becomes, like, what did I learn about the food system that I didn't know before? And the biggest thing was that I really came to appreciate how much labor, how much human intelligence and wit and work goes into feeding me and how far and vast the web that sort of is doing that is. You know, the garlic that I mince at home into stews was usually picked by somebody from Mexico in the off season. It's probably an Argentinian because that's where a lot of the garlic comes from in the off season. Groceries on the shelves, cantaloupes and corn and plantains in the bins, they were all put there by you know, moms and dads and 20 year olds who deliver pizza on the side. And the food on my plate at a restaurant could well have been prepared by a Mexican, cooked by a Jamaican, served by an African American and cleared away from my table by a Somalian. And I learned very clearly that the cheapest food in the store isn't just something that came from a farm and it's not something that there was you know, a demand for and people went out and filled that demand. A lot of what we eat is there because it's been encouraged and supported by tax dollars and public policies. So when I tried to feed myself while broke, you know, I didn't do very well. In my first job in the fields, I totally failed, in fact, um, but I got better at it. But for a lot of families, this is really still very difficult. Um, hunger in America, and I've actually written about this uh, for National Geographic, hunger really has nothing to do with a lack of food, and it has very little to do even with a lack of wages. I'm uh, sorry, with a lack of jobs. It's the lack of wages, even for people who have jobs. Fully 75% of the people who run out of food at least once during the year in this country live in a household where someone is working, and 59% um, have somebody working full time in the household. And so this brings me back to this question of the foodies and why food isn't just about consumption, but it's actually about justice. Because if food's just about consuming luxury products, that's really the problem with foodies, right? Like it's not, 
if it's harmless, no harm, no foul, like why worry about it? And maybe that's true for fashion and sneakers, but you know, after doing the reporting for this book, I don't really think that should be how we think about food. Lettuce, ingredients, and apples, or meat raised without a lot of antibiotics, those aren't things that should be considered fashion accessories. These are things that are part of health and they're essential to life, and the same way clean air and water are. And they're right up there with life and liberty and pursuing happiness because you can't really do any of that if you don't have health. And I think it helps to sort of understand this a little bit if we use an analogy and talk a little bit about water. You know, we don't really go around saying, you know, if people really cared about drinking clean water, they'd spend more time and money on it. You know, we don't say, well, we've sort of got dirty water everywhere and you're welcome to drink that, but if you want clean water, you're just going to have to walk a few extra miles. Right? Instead, we say everyone needs clean water. So we're going to build water systems and treatment plants so that everyone has it and doesn't have to worry about it. And yet, when we talk about healthy food, we say if you really cared about your health, you'd go out of your way to eat better. And we say if you want healthy food, you're going to have to completely change the way you live your life and find a way around contemporary American work culture and wages and expectations in order to eat it. This is your problem. You need to go solve it on your own. But I really don't think Americans are choosing bad diets because we don't care, and we're not choosing them because we simply need to hear the right argument. So we've been told for the last 40 years, right, that we need to eat our vegetables, and that does not have seemed to have done anything to change our diets. And what keeps us eating keeps us from eating well, I think, is that we've developed a culture and society and government and business mandates that makes eating well really hard to do. And after reporting this, I'm really convinced it's not that we're each making bad choices. It's just that as a society, we've made it the bad choices the easiest to make. And once you accept that, right, I think your prescription for it changes, right? It's different than what sort of Michael Pollan talks about, which is often about sort of shopping better. Um, and I think when you change your perspective like that, that's really what sort of links the kind of work that I do to the kind of stuff that Dorothy Day did. Because Dorothy Day looked at the world and she thought, we can do better, right? We have to do better. And I, you know, I like to sort of, whenever I sort of feel very frustrated about things, you know, remember for the first 30 some years of Dorothy Day's life, we didn't have minimum wages or overtime or workplace safety or weekends. And the movement she was a part of is what helped to change that. And you know, now we're in this interesting moment where in some ways right, we have to fight again to win some of those same battles that Day had won. Um, but my work is suggesting to me that we're also going to have to wage and try to win one about our food system. And I'm really privileged and honored to be on this planet at a time when I've been able to help develop a conversation about that. And I've gone and done the reporting and thought a lot about what I saw and what it means for the world and tried to share that with folks. Um, and in true journalist fashion, right, where it sort of leaves me is that I'm very excited and interested to see what you all do with that information. Thank you.